bless up guys welcome back to another video thank you guys so much for coming back to another video guys if you're new here guys guys if you're new here um let me tell you guys what to do take a second to hit that subscribe button take a second to hit that like button and take a second to drop a comment you understand so today guys we're gonna be having one of those reasoning one of those canada immigration reasoning and this one is specific for persons who are thinking of coming to canada and a visitor's visa and convert it to a work permit so if you guys been following our channel you guys would have seen that my family member who are family members who are here came on a visitor's visa and they were able to successfully convert that to a work permit so i'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about that process holistically so that for other persons who are thinking of coming through a similar route can have like a factual example to follow to know um not only that it's possible but also what route or avenue that they can take you understand but before we get into the conversation guys i would like to let you know that i'm not a registered immigration consultant any information that you hear in this conversation or, or, or on this channel is really based on my own experience and experience of friends and family members as you guys can see in other words second hand information so this is no way shape or form legal advice and um, not advice that you can use as immigration consultant advice. Make sure that whatever you're doing, you're doing your own research to not only fact check what I am saying, but also bear in mind that everybody's case is different and immigration is always changing. Okay, that was a long intro. If you guys are new here, my name is Dems. I'm a Jamaican who migrated to this beautiful, beautiful country called Canada. I came as an international student back in 2019. I'm now a permanent resident. And I'm living here in the beautiful province of Alberta, a small town called Grand Prairie. Now, that is for the new audience. All the old audience who have been here from day one, <laughs> being up on yourself. Thank you guys so much for the love. Thank you guys so much for the support over the years. And I just want to let you guys know that I really appreciate it. You understand? You guys have many, many options that you can that you can watch on YouTube, and you guys choose to support me over the years, me and my family. So I just want to say thank you, and I look forward to uh, much bigger and better things with you guys, of course, and all the persons who will be coming on board. There's a lot more space for a lot of persons to come on the wagon, so we appreciate you guys subscribing. All right, and share it with your friends as well. Share it with your friends who are thinking of coming to Canada and they want to see what Canada is like or have an idea of how to get here. Share some videos with your friends and family members. Take their phone and get them to subscribe and stuff like that. Sometimes when we're watching the videos, we, we don't remember that we haven't actually subscribed to the channel. So you have to be intentional, right? You have to be intentional to subscribe and intentional to like the video, right? So, okay, that's enough begging. <laughs> okay, guys, so a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, um, Immigration Canada came out with a temporary policy that, that allows foreign nationals to convert their visitor's visa to a work permit without leaving Canada. Now, this was mainly um, brought in effect because of COVID. So throughout COVID, a lot of persons was stuck in Canada because of the travel restrictions that was placed on many countries and they weren't able to return home. And back then, having a visitor's visa, or even now, having a visitor's visa, you were not allowed to work, right? So a lot of persons were stuck in Canada and they, they weren't allowed to work. So of course, that was a very difficult period of time for them, particularly. So what the Canadian government did was to say, okay then, if you're here with a visitor's visa, and you're able to get a job, um, a LMIA job, then you can then convert your work per your visitor's visa to a work permit without leaving Canada. Before you had to leave Canada, apply and then come back. So because you were already here and they can't travel, they said, okay, then you can do it without leaving Canada. Now that was mainly intended to be a COVID-19 policy. However, after COVID, slow down or uh, after covid ended it was extended the policy but it was still a temporary policy it was extended to january of 2025 so we still got a couple more months to go so what a lot of persons have been doing over the period of time they hear that 
and then they come to Canada with a visitor's, visitor's visa in hopes of finding a job, in hopes of converting to a work permit, right? Now, to say the least, a lot of persons have been successful in doing it, but there's many more persons who has not been successful in doing it. And <clears throat> in truth and in fact, the persons who have not been successful in doing it is not necessarily based on reasons of their own. It's just sometimes that the opportunities didn't come their way, right? But what I would like to tell somebody that even though the policy still exists, it is not easy. And it is not easy for no more reasons. One of the main reasons why it's not easy is because a lot of persons underestimate how hard it is to find an LMIA job. So they come with their determination, which is good to have determination and be driven and be motivated to go out there and, and look it. However, sometimes they underestimate how difficult it is. It is very difficult, right? And then when they get here and, you know, sometimes they come with like a $5,000 or a $10,000 thinking that, okay, then, then this is going to take me through to another three months, another five months, another six months. I'm going to be able to find a job. And then reality hit them and then realize that not only did they not have enough money, but finding a, a LMIA job is like looking for a diamond <laughs> in the middle of a desert. Hard, very, very hard. So um, the shock of that sometimes allow persons to go back home and then try different avenues, right? And write it off as a, as a failure. The other reason why it don't work is because a lot of persons choose to go to the populated areas. A lot of persons choose to go to the areas that um, are very competitive. Now, when you go to the competitive areas more often than at the big cities, the chances of finding an LMI job is significantly reduced, right? It's just the truth of the matter. So if it is that you are thinking of coming as a visitor and your hopes is to find an LMI job to get a work permit, why would you go to, a, to, one of the, or to some of the most competitive places in Canada? I've never really understood that, but a lot of persons, um, I don't know why people do what they do, but I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of persons fail. They, they see the big city, it's appealing, and then they pull off the big city, pull them there, and then they realize that, snap, it's not working out. Because there's just simply not enough opportunities, right? You have persons in the big cities who have their citizenship, their PR, work permits, study permit, who can't find jobs. So being there as a visitor, I'd say you're at the end of the food chain, you are the last person to find a job in such a competitive environment. But instead, what I would say to that person is to go to a small town, go to a smaller city um, where the labor market demand is a little bit more higher in terms of um, there's more jobs than people. <laughs> that way you will be able to probably find a job more easier than in the big city. Other persons don't look at it that way. But of course, as I said, this is not no way, shape or form legal advice. I just my, my, my two cents, right? Just my two cents in the, in the conversation for persons who are thinking of going a similar route. Okay. Now, remember at the beginning of the conversation, I told you guys, if you're new here, that my brother came here um, with his wife and daughter on a visitor's visa. Now, we are in the province of Alberta, right? Now, in Alberta, you have a number of different streams or provincial nomination streams outside of just finding an LMIA job. One of the streams is a, is a stream that I've covered multiple times on our channel, which is the Rural Renewal Stream. Now, when the Rural Renewal Stream just came out, it, um, Grand Prairie, where I'm living, was one of the first communities to be um, endorsed in that stream. And a lot of persons has been moving from other parts of Canada, like international students, who can't find um, PR op op opportunities in their cities, like the Tar the um, provinces, sorry, like the Ontarios, the BCs and stuff, they come to Grand Prairie to get the Rural Renewal Stream. But a big part of the Rural Renewal Stream is it allows the employer to employ foreign nationals and then that job become LMIA exempt. And then you are able to apply for your work permit, right? So that was something that I found very fascinating when it just came out. And funny enough, I did probably four or five videos covering the topic of the Rural Renewal Stream and even going as far as 
going over some of the employers, going over the cities that are a part of the Royal Renault stream. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't very, it, a lot of persons didn't really take up the opportunity of what the Rural Renewal stream presented, right? Because we did the videos, we put it out there, but we didn't really get a lot of feedback. We didn't really get a lot of feedback from persons who um, wanted to know a lot more about it. It was just more like another stream and people shrug it off, but it's a stream that was so opportunist for persons who wanted to come to Canada, right? And the fact that these are in rural communities in Alberta, it simply means that if you are willing to go rural, the chances of you finding a job offer increase significantly. So when my brother came, the, the goal was to find an LMIA job or the Rural Renewal Stream job because the goal was always to um, try to see if we can find a job offer to get their status changed, right? Now, if that didn't work out, of course, they would have gone back home and try again. But... Luckily, um, we were able to find a job offer within a field that he's um, experienced in. Um, now, what was that job search like? You guys may be asking. Now, the job search for somebody who is looking for a job offer to renew or to change their status is different than somebody who has status and is looking for a job. Now, when you are looking for a job offer to change your immigration status, First things first, you can't be partial. You have to be impartial. And by that I mean you can't, you don't get to pick, you know, you don't get to really be picky um, in terms of what type of job you get and what type of job you do because the job purpose is really to, the, the main purpose is really to get that job so you can change your status, in other words. So a lot of persons, <laughs> and it's funny, because a lot of persons, um, don't want to do certain jobs. And that's just the truth of the matter. However, I always say short-term pain, long-term gain. Short-term pain, long-term gain. So as a visitor, you have to be looking at the big picture at all times, changing a status. That is the big picture, right? And be very flexible, be very, be very um, witty, be very honest, right? Be very honest and open. You see, when you connect with an employer and the employer feel your energy and see that you can bring value to them, a lot of employers will go out of their way to help you. And that is what a lot of persons don't know. A lot of persons lie to employers and then when it's time for them to provide the documents is when they're going to say that, hey, I'm on a visitor's visa, this is what I'm looking for, and then you have already started off on the wrong foot, right? What I would say is to start honest. Be honest. Go up front, connect with the employer, and then just state the truth. Because that is what we did. Now, we literally just walked into a business, resume in hand, um, and asked for the, for, the, for the manager or the owner, or whoever, depends on the size of the business, and just say, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a job. I'm looking for a job. This is my situation. And... I saw where you guys are looking for, if you did some research, you can say, well, I saw where you guys are part of the Royal Renault stream, or I saw where you guys are looking for this position, and I think I'd be a good fit. And make an impression. Don't be, don't be afraid to um, approach these employers and ask for exactly what you want, right? The other thing that you want to do that we also did was to build connections, now, it's not what you know is going to take you through this life, oftentimes, contrary to what a lot of persons might have told you in the past um, about like going to school and make sure that you get your good education, which is important, but that's not as important as who you know. What you know is not as important as who you know, right? So build connection because your network determines your net worth, right? So start building connections, even as a visitor. If you're a church-going person, go to church. Build that connection. If you're not a church-going person, go to different events. Go to business mixers. Go to the chamber of commerce mixers. Get, in, get where the business persons are. Go in the circle that you want to, to, to be a part of, right? And oftentimes, when you get into those circles, there's somebody there to help you, right? So that is what I'll tell you guys. Now, do I think things are... 
I'm not gonna say easy because it's never been easy, but do I think things are more accessible now, um, like they were a year ago? Probably not, because a lot of things has been changed with immigration. So likewise, the study permit um, application process, the international student process, the work permit process as well is under scrutiny as well, right? So things are always changing. So I think things are a lot more rigid right now than they were even a year ago. So do I suggest for anybody to come as a visitor and try to convert their status? My simple answer would be, it depends. <laughs> it really depends on your, your, your cash flow, your support, where you're going, and all of these factors, right? If you have enough support, then go for it, because support is very, very, very important. Now, when I just came to Canada, guys, um, yeah, we had a we had a soft landing. Uh, um, I'd call it a soft landing. We were able to stay with family for a couple of months, um, say two to three months, but then we were on our own. But in truth and in fact, um, we were able to go on our own because we had status. Now, if you don't have status, two to three months is not gonna be enough. Let me just say that, two to three months is not gonna be enough. So if you're gonna be staying with family or friends, be prepared to stay for at least eight to 12 months, right? Because that's so long, it possibly might take for things to work out for you, right? So if you have support and your support is right, then you can go for it. But if you don't have support, it's gonna be almost impossible right, right now speaking. Possible, but no. probable, but not. Oh, what am I trying to say? I'm saying that it's 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 probable. The probability is there for it to happen, but it's highly unlikely for it to happen, right? So it's not impossible, but it's highly improbable. If that's even a word, you guys get what I'm saying. So make sure that your support is right. Make sure that the support is right before you decide to make this move and this transition to come to Canada as a visitor and then try to convert your status to a work permit. Your support and your research is your best friend. Without any of those things, whew, we're that way, right? Now, <laughs> if you manage to have the support and you are able to, you know, extend your visitor status if things don't work out for you immediately, um, keep back some money because you're going to have to potentially do a flagpole. Now, if you guys have watched my last video on my channel, if you guys haven't seen it as yet, please take a second to add it to your playlist right now. Yes, go and watch it. That is where my brother and my sister-in-law, they went to flagpole um, to get their work permit, right? So depending on where you are, you might have to drive to a border, which can take you probably 10, 15 hours from where you are staying, potentially. Might be shorter, I know. So for what we call the simple times, I know that somebody might live next door to the border. I'm talking about in um, other cases, right? Other cases, you might have to drive 10, 15, or even more hours to get to the border. Make sure that you have some money saved up in the eventuality that you have to do a quick flagpole. You're gonna need to get a car, you're gonna need to go, um, go to an hotel, you're gonna need a number, you're gonna need gas, you're gonna need food unless you have somebody who can take you to the border, right? Now, talking from my brother and sister-in-law's experience, the flagpoling process seems to be a very straightforward process, as long as you have the right documentation. The documentations are key. Now, the, the flagpoling process is going through the border over the U.S. side, Letting them know that you want to do flagpole, they're gonna potentially try to intimidate you somewhat. Then when you make a turnaround, you come back to the Canada side. When you come to Canada, you're entering Canada, the border services agents are gonna ask you a series of questions, check your documents, find out what you're trying to do in Canada, and then um, decide whether or not you're gonna be granted access and your permits. But from what I've seen, the border services um, agents are pretty understanding as long as you have the right documentation. You don't want to get to the border and then find out that you left your passport. 
<laughs> and funny enough, like when my brother and sister-in-law got to the bar, that there was something that was not done. And this was something that um, I personally didn't even know that this was something that needed to be done. And I'm going to tell you guys here right now, so if you're in a similar situation, you don't make the same mistake as well, right? Now, when you get a job offer underneath the rural renewal stream, the, the employer has to create a GC key employer portal and upload that job offer and then get approval from IRCC and then they're going to get an employer compliance number. Now that employer compliance number is the number that they need to show that the job offer is LMIA exempt. Without that number, you cannot get your work permit, right? So they didn't find this out until they actually went to the border and the border services agent asked them for this number. Then they found out that, hey, we actually needed something else. But luckily, it's like a two-hour process, and then they get, like, the number. The employer get the number at the same time. Luckily, the employer was um, um, available for a phone call, um, and they were able to get the process done and submit it and pay the fees and get the number, like, within an hour and a half. But what if the employer was not available? What if the employer was not available? You'd have wasted 10 to 15 hours Wasted money, waste time, waste energy, go to the border, only to be refused. So it's called an employer compliance number. So if you're in a similar situation, make sure that you're having this conversation with your employer to make sure that that process is done before you get to the border, right? Without that number, your work permit will be refused. But once you have all your documentation and all your docs are in a row, Alpha times than that, unless there's high suspicions, you'll be approved. Now, flag pulling is not an illegal process. It's it's usually it's usually recommended for you to do it, do your application online rather than flag pull. But if you choose to flag pull, it's not an illegal process, right? So a lot of persons are a lot more persons has been using a flag pulling option rather than the online application. One, you get your work permit the same time. And two, you don't have to go through um, the excruciating waiting period that you'd have had to go through up to this particular point in time, right? So these are just some things I would like to share for persons who are coming and they're looking to convert to a work permit, study permit, whatever the case may be. Also, what I'd like to add is that the flag polling um, process is only for work permits and study permits, and you have to have status. Like for example, if, you're, if your visitor status is expired, like if you're in the country for more than six months and you haven't gotten a visitor's record, then you're in the country illegally. If you're in the country illegally, you cannot flag pull. You can't flag pull. You have to have legal status. You have to have legal status. Based on my understanding of the process, you have to have legal status to be able to flag pull, right? Otherwise, you're gonna have to apply through some other means, some other medium. I can't say which medium, right? Um, but definitely, um, the flag polling process is there. So if you're thinking of coming as a visitor, make sure that you are not only watching this video, but you are doing your research to make sure that this is the best decision for you, right? Now, do I think it's worth it? Absolutely. Well, make sure that you have the right support. Make sure that you have people who would be willing to sacrifice for you because that's what is going to be required. Persons are going to sacrifice their money. Persons are going to sacrifice their time. Persons are going to sacrifice their space, their freedom for, for your betterment. Make sure you have somebody who, is be, who would be willing to do that. And a lot of times people say that they're willing, and then when they are in the situation, it's a totally different ball game. So make sure that before you decide to make that decision, you are having an open, frank conversation with the individuals who are going to be supporting you. And yes, I know people change. A lot of times people think they can do something and then when they're in the situation, when they're actually in the position, they realize that, hey, can't really manage this. I can't really, I can't really give up my, my time and my space like I thought I would have. And uh, that is why a lot of persons get put out. <laughs> and there's breakdowns a lot of, of a lot of relationships, right? Now, as far as I am concerned, I'm really, really happy 
that our journey was able to benefit another family member and extended family members in the sense that we made the sacrifice of coming to Canada um, and we went through the struggles that we had to go through and we just landed and we had a very difficult transition. But once we transitioned, everything started working out perfectly fine. And we are happy that we were able to do that because now we're able to help other family members who will be able to help other family members. And that's how you break the cycle, guys. That's how you break the cycle of poverty. That's how you break the cycle of generational curse. That's how you break the cycle of just um, no elevation and no growth, right? It takes one person to be the bridge. And if you are watching this and you are somebody who has migrated already, and you're in a position to help another family member, be it to put them up in your space for a little while, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, like, in, like we call this big foreign. When you're in a foreign land, when you are transitioning, somebody had to help you, some way, shape, or form. I always say, pay it forward, pay it forward. Help a family member. Don't strive to be the, the person at the top of the tree. There's space at the top of the tree for everybody else to join you at the top of the tree. So don't be selfish. Don't be um, that person who just doesn't want to help anybody else to come to Canada or to come to U.S. or wherever you are at. Make sure that you are constantly looking to help your family members. It's better to teach somebody to fish than to hand them a fish. If you don't get them a platform, they're always going to be depending on you for that source of life, that, that fish, right? Help them to fish for themselves so they can change their lives as well and change the extended family life. That's how I look at it. Guys, if you're still here at the end of this reasoning and you haven't already liked this um, video, please take a second to hit that um, like button. If you haven't already subscribed, what are you waiting on? Subscribe to the Anderson's family. We really would appreciate it, guys. And drop a comment. Let us know what you think about this. Sit down. We really, really, really would appreciate it. All right, guys? I'm going to end the conversation right here. Let me know what you think about it in the comment section. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out.